Well, listen. A while ago, we talked about our Father who art in heaven. Well, I thought it was important that we go ahead and revisit that same exact sermon and uh, pretty much the same title. It's called Our Father Revisited. I couldn't come up with something more original than that. I'm sorry. Okay, my wife's the artistic one in the family. But if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out and open up to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to take a look specifically at verse 9. It says, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. So let me ask you, brothers and sisters, just to kind of get your minds working here, because I like you guys to think as I'm thinking. What does it mean, hallowed be thy name? I thought it would be the best place to start was trying to figure out what this specifically means, because this is an important part to the verse. It's an important part to us. Hallowed be thy name. I think to understand the full significance of this entire passage, we have to start with this one little phrase, how would be thy name? God's name is the most holy and most honorable. In fact, in the verse right here, in verse 9, it doesn't actually read, how would be thy name? It actually says, make your name holy. God, make your name holy. It's passive in its context because it is God that makes his name holy and it is God that keeps his name holy. It's not dependent on us having any part in this. You are not the one that is responsible for making God's name holy. You are not the one that sustains the holiness of God because he does that in himself and by himself, without the need of us. And even when we walk away from him, even when we fail in our walk, he's still holy. Even when you're faithless, he is still holy. That's what this passage is letting us know, is that he brings the honor, sanctification, holiness, and glory to his name. He's the one that brings that. We're praying to God, Lord, make your name holy and keep it holy. God's name is holy no matter what happens. To see how holy God is, let's take a look. Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to see God revealing himself to the prophet Isaiah. It says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two they covered their face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Imagine the sight of this. Imagine Isaiah standing inside of God's throne room and just seeing it starting to fill with smoke, seeing God's robe, not even the image of God yet, just seeing the image of God's robe filling the entire temple and the angels of God flying around, covering their, hand, covering their face, covering their feet because of the holiness of God they're doing this and singing, holy, holy, holy. Imagine yourself in that position. How it would feel for you. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Take in that statement for a second. Is the earth giving God glory? Or is God giving a glimpse of his glory here? 
God is revealing His glory in all the creation that you see around you. He's revealing His glory in His thumbprint that He's given on each of you that are created in His image. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was seen as a righteous man to God. That's why Isaiah, as Pastor Chip talked about not too long ago, Isaiah was seen as the prince of all prophets. Isaiah was highly esteemed by God. And here, Isaiah, seeing God for who he is, not who he wants him to be, he says, woe is me, I'm ruined. Oh my gosh. In other words, I'm seeing God and I realize how tiny and sinful I truly am. You see, when we have that eye-open experience, when we see God for who He is and not who we want to make Him out to be, when we see God in comparison to ourselves, you have this same moment where you say, I'm nothing. Take a look at the majestic and holiness of God in Psalm, Psalm 8. Open your Bible, Psalm 8 again. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established your strength. Because of your adversaries to make the enemy of the revengeful cease. Now pay attention to this. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you, have, that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you have crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the birds of the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who is man compared to the holiness of God is what David was trying to get to. Who is man that you would even think of me, God, because you are so mighty, you are so awesome, you've created things just with your very word. And then you squeezed me, you shaped me into existence. Who am I in comparison to you and your majesty and your glory? To think. To think, the creator of the world, the speaker of things into existence, wants you to call him daddy. Take that in for a second. Take a look at Hebrews 2, 10, 11. It says, for it was fitting for him, for whom for all, are all things, and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. It's saying that God saw it as a fitting thing. He saw it as a perfect thing to go ahead and let his son die on a cross at Calvary for us. To become the creator, and not just the creator, but the finisher and perfecter of our faith. So we could be called children of God. Of the most holy, majestic God. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified 
are all from our Father. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Do you realize that Jesus calls you brothers and sisters? Jesus calls you brothers and sisters. And it's because of what he did on the cross on Calvary. It's because of what he did being born in human flesh and dying on the cross for us that we can call the majestic, the holy, the glorious God our Father. We've got a rule in my house that whenever one of the kids comes up and they want to talk to us, unless, you know, it's, we got something burning on the stove, we stop what we're doing and we turn around and pay full attention. I, I suggest that all of you try to do the same thing. If you have the TV on, your kid comes up to you and says, Mommy, Daddy, I want to show you something. Instead of saying, oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Stop what you're doing and pay attention to that child because that's exactly what God does when we cry out to him, Daddy, he stops what he's doing. He says, yes, my child, I'm listening. Now listen, I realize in a group this size, not every, every single person here has had the best relationship with their parents. I realize in a group this size, maybe one of you or more, more of you have been hurt by your relationship with your parents. Maybe there was abuse. Or maybe they just didn't care. But you see, the relationship with this father is one that is completely different. It is the perfect parental relationship. This relationship, this parent says, never will I leave you. This is a parent that says, come to me when you're weary. This is a parent that says, nothing can separate you from the love I have for you. Isn't that a beautiful thought? That's a parent. And when I look at what his relationship is with me, I realize how far I fall in my own relationship with my children. We need our bond with our Heavenly Father. We need His love. We need His care. We need His guidance. And yes, even though we don't like it, we need His discipline. And what was learned from the failure to thrive in these countries? What have we learned from this? Parental involvement is necessary to growth. Parental involvement is necessary to growth. It's what carries you in life, grows you mentally and physically and spiritually. Without our Heavenly Father's involvement, without us crying out to Him and going to Him in His Word, we have failure to thrive and we're not developing as we should as children of God. We're doomed to have failure to thrive if we're not coming to Him. Galatians 4, 6 says, Because you are sons of God, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God has given us the ability to cry out to Him in the moment of pain and in weakness. Abba, Father, Daddy, come rescue me, come save me. The touch of the Father right there in the time of need. The story of the prodigal son. Like I've already said, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and follow along with me. Open up to Luke chapter 15. We're going to take a look at the story of the prodigal son. It says, verse 11, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, went out onto a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Wow, kind of child that you really 
really want to have, right? Yeah, give me 10 of those kids. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to become impoverished. He went hungry. He had nothing. He sold everything. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. He went and worked as a slave. And he sent him out into the fields to feed his swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods of the swine, that the swine were eating. And no one was giving him anything. He had no food. He was starving. So he would rather desecrate his body by eating the food of pigs. But when he had come to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I've sinned against heaven through my living, through my actions of working with these filthy animals. And in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. This is a little inward monologue that's going on with this son. He's saying, I'm not worthy to be one of my, son, my father's children anymore. I've ruined my relationship with him. I've walked away from him. I've worked with filthy animals where religiously I can't do anything now. But I'll go back and I'll be treated as a, as a worthy slave in my father's sight. So he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring a fattened calf, the fattened calf. Kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. You see, the son had a few things going for him that were completely wrong. He had a few things that were working completely against him. First, he took all of his inheritance and he went ahead and he just squandered it on dissipation, squandered it on a sinful life, just got rid of it doing whatever he wanted. Anything his dad said he couldn't have, couldn't do, he went ahead and did, spent it all. What he could enjoy, he did. And as a result, he lost everything. His entire inheritance was gone. Second thing that was going against him was he worked as a pig farmer and religiously he was unclean as a result. Religiously, ceremonially, he could not be part of Jewish custom. He couldn't even come in contact with a Jewish person like his father. Because his dad would then become ceremonially unclean. You see, the son had rejected everything that he had learned in his life as a child growing up religiously. He would be looked at like a leper and have no rights. He would be an outcast. But let's look. What was the father's reaction? What was the father's reaction? It was to run out and embrace why did the father run out? Well, maybe it was because he was afraid that his son would get second doubts and turn around and walk away. And the pain of losing his son twice was something he couldn't bear. You can almost imagine the father thinking of his son, sitting down in his, in his house, wondering where he's at. Is my son safe? 
Are the rumors that I've been hearing true? The pain of the separation that he had with his son still very raw in his heart. He gazes out the window and he sees the image of his son standing there, coming over the hill. And the hope that it's true overtakes him to where he just runs, he darts out and he goes out and he embraces his son. And his son, weary from no food, the hard work, smelling like a stable from like pigs, just, just the look of anemia on his face. But what does the father see? The father sees the image of the little toddler that he had fallen in love with. He sees the image of that baby boy that had stolen his heart years before. He doesn't see the ruined person in front of him. And that's the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. When we ruin ourselves, when we squander our heavenly inheritance, when we turn away from what we've learned in our entire life at church, in Sunday school, wherever it may have been, and we walk away, He's there to embrace us with open arms. He still sees you as that sweet child that he fell in love with and proved that love with arms opened wide on a cross. We have a Father in heaven waiting to embrace us, waiting to hold us, waiting to run out and embrace us and grab us. But we need to turn back to him. There's so much significance in this passage. So much significance. We're being taught here of the relationship of the Father has nothing to do with us. Something that we need to get out of this is the relationship of the Father doesn't depend on you, the child. The Father sustains His fatherhood or His parenthood in Himself. When the son walked away and spent all of his money, took off his signet rings and sold them so he could have a little bit more to eat or a little bit more sinful pleasure, did that end the relationship with him and his father? No. When the son came to his dad and painfully said, Dad, I know you're not dead, but I want what's mine. I want what's mine now. Did the father say, that's it, get out of my sight. Here it is and leave. You're no longer my son. Was that it? Was that the end of the relationship? No. Why? Because the parent role, the parent relationship depends on the father, not the child. It's sustained through the father. And the beautiful things represented here. When the son came back, when the son came back and he's beaten and he's broken and he says, Father, I realize what I've done. I've ruined my life. I've done all these dumb things. Forgive me. The father says to his slave, go get me a ring. And such a small word, we kind of miss it. The significance of that. But the father is really saying, go get my signet and put it back on my child. I'm reclaiming him for my own. You see, no matter how bad and how low we can get, the Father's wanting to reclaim us for His own. This story is speaking of God's relationship with His children and how all of it relates and relies on Him. Just like His holiness is sustained by Himself, His fatherhood is sustained by Himself. The most holy God has given us the honor of calling him Father. John 1, 12 and 13, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, 
nor of the will of man, but of God. This honor will never be taken away from us. The honor of being called children can never be taken away from us. Our role as loved children does not fade. It doesn't ebb and flow. It stays the same, consistent, just like our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. 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 So let me ask you, brothers and sisters, where is your relationship with your Heavenly Father right now? Is it the same place it was last year? Did you make your New Year's resolution? I want to grow in Christ now. I want to grow in Christ this year. And are you at the same place you were last year? Is it at the same place you were when you became his child? The day you trusted Christ as your Savior? Are you being a rebellious child and walking away from what you've known your whole life? Walking away from the love of your Father? Then cry out. Call on Him, Abba, Father, because His arms are waiting to embrace you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come before you and call you Father because you remain the same. Not because of us, but because of you. Lord, I'd like to pray that if there's anyone here that has not put their trust in you as their Savior, they're still depending on themselves to get them to heaven. They're offering you dirty rags and saying, Lord, let me into your heaven. I pray right now they'd just have a change of heart and that they'd trust you, the one and only.